in the end, the, the beautiful thing about market making is it's very democratic. And like, if you aren't making the markets better, you don't get to trade. So, you know, there's... Would you be able to help our viewers on the channel understand what market making is and how firms primarily make money out of market making activities? I've been in the same kind of market for a long time. I've been, I've seen, you know, from the days of trading on sheets in the pit to the things now, I mean, would you be sure. willing to say what the minimum salary that you've seen in the industry for someone who's first starting out all the way into the there, there there is theoretically edge in every trade um but the the margin for error is insanely small people making directional bets are usually your best friend uh they aren't playing so in options you know they're not playing volatility they're playing directional okay i can easily hedge direction risk and it's incredibly interesting to see like some of the most successful firms today how close they came to closing down like <laughs> The number of firms that are, are gigantic today that, that have came within a hair of failing. What advice would you give um, to young people? What differentiates a candidate getting in and what would you recommend to aspiring? You know, so getting the actual application of the way markets work. Uh, so combine that with a the theory is where a lot of people run into trouble. Know that this industry changes so fast. Um, this actually has bitten me a couple times in my career. You become really successful and you, you, know, you kind of like rest on your laurels, uh, but like, it, if you're not constantly innovating, constantly changing, you get left behind so fast. So just always, always, always be pushing, always be curious. So welcome back to the Quant Insights uh, second podcast. Here we have a guest who wants to remain anonymous today, but has 20 years of experience um, market making for different firms. And he's going to be referred to as John today, John Smith. So John, hey, great to have you on the podcast. Would you be able to explain a little bit of your market making experience and how you got into the space and your career development today? Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I got into options making, market making 20 years ago. Um, I actually applied to a firm out of school. I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I had a computer science degree and decided that a cubicle was not for me. And so this seemed somewhat appealing. Uh, I went to the firm, I traded in the pit for a number of years, uh, eventually started, uh, traded on my own for a long time. And then when, and now I'm back to working for firms again, um, just to be generic, but, uh, I've been in the same kind of market for a long time. I've been, I've seen, you know, from the days of trading on sheets in the pit to the things now, I mean, from markets that are 20 X wider than, than, than they are now, things are hundreds of times faster uh, now than they were then. So it's. It's been a wild ride, a lot of changes. That's, that's really interesting. What, what, what would you say is the biggest difference um, between the changes then when you're trading in the pits and you're saying markets are so wide? Was there more opportunity then or is there more opportunity now? It's just different. Um, there's a lot more volume now and the pricing now is so much better. Like back then, you 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 know, you, you weren't able to put things in as fast. You weren't able to run your, your, your smiles as fast. So like you're trading off sheets and you might have something worth five and it's trading nine. Uh, and, you know, so you like, you know, and try to adjust your sheets in your head. So like, there's just a more margin for error. Uh, and I like to tell people, yeah, like things used to be a dollar wide. So if you were, you know, if you were wrong, it, you had a lot of room for error. Now, if you're off by a, a dime, you're on the wrong side. Back then, if you were, oh, I have 90 cents of edge and this is $7. Now you, now you fold it instead of buying it. Um, and then like things just happen a lot faster. You know, in the pit, people have to physically ask you for quotes. And so you're yeah. always... Uh, you know, you're on top of it and you can change it and, you know, different markets you can update quickly. But like now with the screens, like you, you are vulnerable. Every, you know, you have potentially tens of thousands of markets out there at the same time. And, you know, you got to be on top of things a little bit and there's no one telling you, oh, hey, you're off on this. They tell you you're off on that by trading it with you. So obviously a big difference to having all those screens in front of you now with um, all in-house proprietary trading software that makes looking at all that data, you know, visually in an easy way. Well, I guess um, taking it taking it from the start, would you be able to help our viewers on the channel understand what market making is and how firms primarily make money out of market making activities? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, so I work as an options market maker and what we basically do is you have a theoretical value and then you will vend to the market via computers or voice uh, bids and asks, um, you know, so you're willing to buy or sell everything. Uh, One-sided markets are very frowned upon. Um, and then, you know, you try to incorporate enough edge into your spread such that you will make money over the long run. You will probably make money on more trades than you lose on. 
um, but you tend to lose more money on the ones when you're wrong, uh, be it uh, someone knows something you don't, or uh, if you're slow, like if your systems aren't fast and the underlying moves and you're the last one to move, you you can get ripped on, on Delta. And then, you know, you throw away your whole day's worth of profits on one trade. So like, it's a, it, there, there, there is theoretically edge in every trade, um, but the, the margin for error is insanely small. <laughs> So and and that's that's coming about by informed traders. So if I if I run that back, you're you're trying to be there on both the bid um, and the ask, and then you're trying to make that difference. But then at the end of the day, of course, you end up holding a position because there are informed traders um, who, who who are in the market and they're trying to be directional. So you end up with a position. And I guess what what percentage of the time have you seen it over your career that firms are wanting to hedge? Um, those directional positions that then you have to take on um, versus, uh, you know, actually hold a position on, on your book. Oh, I mean, like you're you're going, like you'll try to keep your, your Greeks as neutral as you can unless you have an opinion, right? Uh, directional risk is the easiest one to hedge. You know, you just get out and hedge there. Then, you know, your vol risk and your interest rate risk and your skew and your curtain, uh, all your teenies are, are where you really run into problems. Um, but Direction. So, in market making, um, people making directional bets are usually your best friend. Uh, they aren't playing. So, in options, you know, they're not playing volatility. They're playing direction. Well, okay, I can easily hedge direction risk. So, uh, you know, I sell you a call and I buy futures, and I hope you win because then you're going to come back and get out of the market, and I'm going to get edged back again. Uh, but people are actually trading volatility, right? So, if someone trades a straddle or something like that. Um, if you know, I don't know how knowledgeable people are listening to this a straddle would be an at the money call in and out the money put together so generally a bet on movement either more or less but those people are actually making a bet that you're probably going to win or lose on you know you can't hedge away that risk unless you have other well you try to by selling other options or buying other options but generally they're actually making a bet against you whereas the directional guy and, and you can make just be friends <laughs> Exactly. So that, that that's actually quite interesting. So you've brought up a uh, almost volatility um, trading strategy there, and you're, you're you're just explaining that it's a bit of a zero sum game with the market maker. Um, I, I would put a caveat to that. Are there, how many market makers are on the exact same product? You know, for example, um, if if I'm doing a, a trade with two legs there, and I'm trying to execute as a retail trader, am I guaranteed to have the same market maker be on both sides of that trade? No, I mean, ideally, you almost aren't. Um, so say most markets, uh, call it 12 to 18 market makers, uh, all you know, well-backed and things like that. So like, in general, as a, as a retail trader, you would want, I mean, you'd, I guess you want everyone there and have it be super tight. But in general, if two market makers disagree so that one guy's a little better bid and one guy's a little better offer, that makes for a tighter market for you. Um, I mean, you can, it depends what markets are. Uh, most products that I'm aware of, no one's really over 25% market share. So you're going to be trading with more than one person, uh, but it would be the same group of people every time. <laughs> Excellent. So, so if, if, if we have 12 um, market makers on the same um, on the same line and they're all trying to compete for the business, I guess the, the, the obvious question is what what's in it for them? So yes, they're going after this difference in bid ask spread and um, they're willing to take on positional risk as a part of that and take on all these other risks um, you know, gamma and theta risk and things like that. But what's what's the primary incentive for them? I mean, you're, you're trying to maximize edge while minimizing risk. Um, so in the end, the, the beautiful thing about market making is it's very democratic. And like, if you aren't making the markets better, you don't get to trade. So, you know, there's <laughs> I mean, a, a payment for order flow aside. Um, so the more aggressive market makers are, the tighter markets become for retail traders. And if you want to be successful in market making you markets get tighter every year. They will continue to get tighter every year. Um, so like, yeah, like you're basically trying to balance. You want to be on the trade, um, but you don't want to get run over on the trade. So like say the market's a buck at a buck 10, right? And you're like, okay, I really want to sell this. Well, say it's price time. You can offer a dollar 10, but you're behind other people or you can offer a dollar five, but maybe that's not enough edge for you to like compensate for your risk. So you're just trying to balance out, you know, making, as, as much money as you can while uh i guess being in the market like if you you're like oh i'm if the market's a buck a buck of five and you're 90 cents at 110 you're, you're just not going to trade <laughs> yeah. so like, it's, it's a balancing act of, of getting on the trades you want to get on trying to avoid the other trades but like 
appropriately charging for risk, I guess is the main the main idea. That makes a lot of sense. And at what at what point on a specific product? I mean, I guess there's all different kind of risk limits, but is it usually a volumetric limit um, that's being run real time that you know a, a market maker would be willing to have on a particular product at a particular tenure? Um, at a particular strike to actually um, take directionally on their book? Oh, sure. I mean, so all market makers will have different risk limits, but to my knowledge, all market makers have risk limits, at least internal. Uh, but like, yeah, you went, you know, you have X amount of Vega risk you could take, X amount of theta. Uh, the big one is what we would call span risk, right? Like, I, I don't want to lose more than X dollars on a 3SD move. And we all know too, like in a three SD move in options is not really a three SD move, right? Like it's they happen way more than they should. Of course, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I mean, you brought up span there. So, uh, is this a daily process that your risk team will run and make you guys aware of? Um, you know, it, do they run the span the span book, or is that going on ongoing during the day during the trading yeah. day? Yeah, that's second by second, and like different wow. risks. You'll you'll have different like um, time frames to cover different risks. Like maybe you're okay with this risk, but you don't want to go home with it, right? So like maybe like by the end of the day, like a lot of times when we were doing our own thing, um, like, okay, we have this span risk and it's not an emergency, right? Because the markets are open. Um, when markets are closed, it's a lot riskier because they can gap a lot easier. Um, so you're like, okay, I want to cover this before I go home. But sometimes you'll have just a gigantic amount. Like say you sold a bunch of calls and you have actual deltas. You're like, okay, I need to get these done in the next 30 seconds. So like different risks have different timeframes. Um, but like everyone kind of has these limits that they're trying to stay under. Um, everyone, you know, that's a, that's another big source of, uh, I don't know. People are still working on like, what, what is the right amount of risk? And every firm's different too. Uh, you know, different firms have different like risk reward profiles they're looking for. Some firms are willing to take a lot more risk than others. Some groups are taking willing to take a lot more risk than others. Some people just want to, you know, harvest bid ask and have a high sharp, and some people are willing to forego sharp for more money uh, or the opportunity for more money. Um, and so and it, in in that opportunity, um, I, I would imagine, of course, even just speaking about different. Um, different ways that you may trade volatility um, as a market maker, that different strategies present different risk reward benefits. So, you know, if, if you have a certain volumetric risk directionally on a um, on a certain product, um, let it be, you know, strike and, and time, but then does that actually present difficulties when looking at the portfolio as a whole, because you may have actually traded off some of that risk by um, you know doing a multi-legged strategy, how did how is that balanced on the risk book, or is it always a volumetric uh, limit per per product? No, I mean so it, it all it, it all goes into the same soup. Um, in a large derivatives market making book, you're going to have God honestly how many hundreds of thousands of strikes on. Um, so you, you just it is. You know, you're like, okay, that has this much Vega, this much skew, this much Kurt, and it just kind of goes into the soup. And then you, you would want to look at like, okay, what's my Vega right here, but also what's my Vega on a move, um, those kind of things. Um, so yeah, you're just kind of trying, trying to handle like things like that. I mean, obviously, like the so you know, in generic options parlance, a straddle would be very risky. A spread, like a bull spread, call spread, put spread, would be less risky, and then a butterfly would be less risky than that. You you constantly want to be liking butterflies, right? So like. If you have a call spread position on your longer call spread, then you'd want to uh, like sell a further out call spread, and then you have the butterfly. Like you basically can mitigate a lot of your risk by tightening things up on the vol smile. Like basically, you want things to be as close as possible. Like your forty-five delta call and your forty delta call are very related, whereas your ten delta put and your five delta call um, are not as related. Um, Again, I, I apologize if I'm getting specific there, but I mean your meteor options <laughs> versus your further away options kind of thing. No, no, that's 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 great insight. So yeah, and and um so market making activities around options specifically. So when you are covering so many products over different times and um and different different durations, different strikes, and pro possibly different products and underlines completely. And you've got one market making person um, sitting on the same thing. What kind of software are they using, and what are they looking at? Are, are they looking at a volatility smile to help them trade? Sure. So at this point, it's almost all proprietary. Um, there are a few vended softwares out there. Uh, 
that like you could use if you want to like look at risk and things like that, but they're generally not fast enough to compete with uh, the firm's proprietary stuff these days. But I mean, we had six screens just full, and like you're still fighting for screen real estate. So you've got your smile up, you got your term structure up, you got the vol on the day. You know, you were looking at sixteen different things. So then you got you know your actual markets, um, opportunities in the market. Uh, other other things like you know so if you're trading oil you might want to keep an eye on gold and the S&P that kind of thing so it's really hard like you kind of get used to it but it's kind of overwhelming at first you're like oh there's 50 things that I'm going to watch right now but there's typically you know, just kind of make a rotation through them <laughs> and and in your experience you know 20 years being on the desk you would have seen a lot of juniors come into this position um from the start i guess what what, what are some of the challenges that a junior market maker has when they first come on the desk that, you know, they've just freshly come out of university, they know all the math, um, they're really switched on, maybe they can do a little bit of programming. What, what are the main challenges that someone like that faces when they first get into the real world and they're trading an options book? Sure. I mean, one of the biggest things is, is that the people coming into the industry now are just smarter <laughs> than they used to be. Uh, the competition for these jobs is, is, is a lot harder. I'm not sure that I would get past a resume pile uh, these days. But a lot of them, I mean, these people are brilliant um and they've had success their whole lives and most things have probably been easy and it, this is a very unique industry uh there aren't really books out there you can't really prepare yourself for for market making you just have to, have to figure it out once you get there you know it's kind of passed down um i'm sure one day there will be uh, but you know so getting the actual application of the way markets work uh to combine that with the theory is where a lot of people run into trouble you know the the situations the market mechanics you know like Things don't have one price. Uh, they have several prices. You know, there's a bid and an ask. And if you want to buy it, you can't necessarily buy the bid. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Maybe you can get it done for bid, but you have to pay the offer. Um, trading costs matter a lot. Uh, you know, the things trade, like, oh, I would have traded that. I'm like, yeah, but, like, you know, we missed it. So now we have to figure out why we missed it. Like, uh, we were taking earlier, like, it's, you have to be very careful with your quotes out there. And so in the theoretical world, like, you get these people um, who are just, like I said, just brilliant uh, and they can do all the math and they, there's a place for that in the theoretical quant as well. But for your quant traders, you also have to understand the way the markets actually work. And that's kind of where people get frustrated. Um, and it takes a long time. You know, um, when I came into this industry, I like to tell people, like, it took me six months before I even knew what I did for a living. Uh, it's just, you're just kind of getting used to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's hard. And there's, you know, these people are used to being able to study things and there's not books for it. So you just kind of have to like figure it out. Uh, and, and some people it comes easy and some people it doesn't. Most people can, if you love it, if you really, really love it, you can generally get there. Um, but it's, it's just a, a different world, I guess. It's, it's very different than academia. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that there's a bit of a training wheel period um, with the actual traders coming onto the desk and a big, big learning curve of how the markets work. Um, and, and interesting to see um, maybe some of it and most of it is in that execution of the actual trading book. Um, and then knowing what your costs are going to be and that you can't necessarily trade at your bid and offer all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, m m moving more into that and the experience that someone needs, what would you recommend um, for a person coming in, knowing what those challenges are? Are there any resources or opportunities that you would recommend to a person coming in who's um, trying to be the best market maker that they can possibly be? Um, sure. I mean, like, you know, your basics, your your probability statistics, your coding, your linear algebra, um, all going to be first and foremost for like just kind of knowledge. Uh, for resources, <laughs> honestly, y YouTube is is quite good. Uh, I can think of uh, at least one channel I know that's pretty strong for quant uh, Python stuff. Um, but like, in general, the best way to learn trading, in my in my opinion, I guess, is to trade. Um, Paper trade, cash trade, small money or something like that. But get get in the market, trade your personal money, see how you do. Like you know, uh, there's there's simulations too where I think you could simulate a market maker strategy. It's hard to, it's probably harder to simulate a market maker strategy, but you can get used to the things like expiration risk and things like that. People have a hard time with that. You know, everyone. I remember we had a uh, quant start uh, when we were on our own, and you know they just don't really understand the incident. Like oh well, volatility. You sold volatility. And then volatility went lower, so you should have made money. And you're like, well, no, because we also moved a lot. And there's a lot of ins and outs of things that, like, you know, you kind of get a feel for there. Like, 
Now, otherwise, you would just always sell things. If 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 you didn't lose money when you moved, like you would always sell every option. Um, you, can, you say you can be directionally right with your volatility, but if your timing's off, then maybe you're not making money fast enough. Yeah. Yeah, or like yeah, like or like you see a lot of this on um, on numbers, right, or uh, like economic data. So like when the unemployment data comes out, volatility will go lower, but also you'll probably move. So you you know your P and L has a lot to do with both of those things. Um, like oh. You sold a 15 ball and now it's a 13 ball, but you moved 4%. Like, so you lost a lot of money because what you're short doesn't even have all. Let's say, okay, so say you short an at the money option, but you move so far that it becomes a 10 delta option. Now, yeah. like, your sensitivity to that parameter is not what it was. <laughs> um, so, like, a lot of the stuff that, like, you don't really get a feel for in a class or, or, or with software, like, you know, um, the, the real application of it, it just, it, it's not totally necessary, but man, does it help with intuition. When you get those quants who actually understand the ins and outs of market mechanics and trading, they those are the people who are going to run these firms someday. Um, the people who can put together like an actual trading idea with the math and the, the coding behind it. It's interesting you just speaking about some of the risks that you need to develop an intuition for when you're live trading and you've got a really large book. I guess um, one of my friends who's a, a market maker, he uh, recounted a time where um, members of his team um, just kind of uh, miscalculated the risk uh, and the potential risk of what it would cost them in terms of the book for dividend risk. So, you know, suddenly some, some of the firms um, undercut their dividend and it made a massive difference to their portfolio just because of how large their portfolio was and the options that they were trading with. So dividend risk was a huge sensitivity and that's not necessarily something that, um, you know, it's really highlighted in the mathematical finance program. They're not talking to you about huge dividend risk um, from a portfolio perspective, but when you're trading really large books, little risks like that that you need to develop an intuition for and at least be aware of, um, they, they do matter. Have you have you got any examples like that where um, you know these little sensitivities that maybe aren't, aren't common to think of aren't your first order Greeks actually have heavily impacted a book? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, dividend risk is first of all hilarious to me, like because yeah, like you said, like I I've heard so many horror stories about dividend risk, but Ted, it's a it's a zero sum game, so someone needs to be making on the other side of that. And I've never heard one person. So I don't know that someone's just really good at it and really quiet. But everything I hear about dividends, everyone's like, losing. Got, yeah, everyone's <laughs> getting blown up. I mean, um, gosh, di the dividends is something. Uh, interest rates was a big one lately. Um, you know, how, how do you model interest rates and in the money options? Uh, you know, some people kind of figure that out um, a little bit faster than others because we had zero percent interest rates for so long that people kind of got sloppy there. Yeah, I mean, your 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 tiny options are going to be one of the worst, the toughest things to model because what can happen to skews and vols and curts on large unexpected moves um your covids uh god i'm old but your great financial crisis you know you've got the spanish banking crisis i mean so many different things um like those things when when a option is close to zero comes back to life that's one of the things that your your models are just not going to get right um oh another <laughs> One of my favorite things that it's a phenomenon in real life that you could never model is what I call like puts with call deltas. Um, so like this happened to Tesla for a while and any other game stock for sure, any meme stock, like the stock will actually rally and the puts will be worth more because volatility will increase so much than they were at the beginning of the day. So the stock's up you know, 40 bucks and the puts are worth more. Like there's no model in the world that's going to be able to figure that out. Uh, so that's, like, uh, that's comical that, that 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 aids itself to the infinite volatility theorem hey yeah oh man <laughs> yeah. yeah like it's yeah i guess yeah like calls go to underlying and puts go to strike right uh but yeah like it's a uh, it's it's phenomenal and like it's it's like so like okay i i, I think i want to short that but then i want to go down so like do i even hedge it? anyway but it, like your model is never going to do that so trying to overcome that things like that where your model is just not going to get it right there's no mathematics that's going to do that correctly for i mean i guess you could have some kind of insane slide but i think it would break i have to assume it would break <laughs> like if you if you start having puts and calls with deltas that are wrong um but yeah that's a, that's a big one um god what else in the treasury market one time they, they changed a deliverable rule so that 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 moved things I won't get into the ins and outs of that, but I mean, there's just a lot of small things that like you, you, 
you made a good point here. You're, you're, you're big Greeks, you know, your Vegas, you Kurt, everyone's aware of, uh, and you can easily hedge that out. But the, the little things like, yeah, like your dividend risk, like your row, like your, uh, anything, uh, can really eat you up sometimes. And, and that's where it sounds like having that experienced person on the desk, John, you know, really, really makes a difference. And because they've, they've seen, they've seen it before. They've heard horror stories from other people at other firms um, about letting this stuff go. So then it's front of mind when you have years of experience. Whereas I guess for that junior trader, who's coming into the role, it's not necessarily front of mind when they're looking at numbers on a screen and they're worrying about one thing and one thing only, which is where am I offering and where am I asking? No, but that goes both ways too. Um, I tell people a lot that I was, I'm, I'm pretty good at managing risk now, but I was a better trader when I was younger um, because I've just seen too much now. Like, you know, like, it's just like, oh, risk I, this could happen and this could happen. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, you're like, if you've, you've been, you only get burned so many times before evolution will, will change your behavior. Um, so it, it's, yeah, that, that definitely goes goes both ways. But like, it, it's good to have balance on the desk too. Like, cause you, you need the people who who are like, this is an opportunity and we need to push it. And then you also need the person who's like, Okay, but let's also think about what could happen. Because um, like you can't you can't be totally risk first. You're not going to make any money, and you can't be blind and stupid. And you're going to lose money. So there's a, there's a balance in there. Of course, no, yeah, and I guess um, now we, we we don't need to talk about strategies directly because obviously yeah, everything's um, kind of proprietary between firms. But um, just in general, I just get giving our audience a better sense of the role of the market maker and where the opportunity is. So if we just paint that picture as um, we, you know, you've got 12 market makers on a particular product and you're looking at your volatility smile, which, you know, has a certain structure. And then you've got your term structure, which is across your 10 years. And you're then trading around that when other people and um, other market participants, and then moving around their bids and asks, is the response of the market maker, is the opportunity in the fact that you have some information that you think that your volatility curve is correct. So therefore, if bids and offers move maybe further up from that, then you may be um, trying to take a position where you're going to benefit from a decrease in prices back to back to kind of the mean volatility curve that you presume. Yeah. Um, and you hit a lot of points there. They were pretty good. Uh, yeah. So like uh, the, the vol smile is going to be the, the big one, right? That's, that's the one that's pretty straightforward to model, and you, it's really hard to get that wrong, um, unless you're in a product like uh, has more jump, like a euro dollar sofa product. You can experience some, a lot of targeting, such that like your distributions are not going to be even. But say we have an oil or a stock, um, a non dividend paying stock, um, yeah. you're, you're it, those, that's going to be your stuff that holds up more often. Um, term structure, there's there's a lot of a lot of stuff there, but like. You got to be careful there. You know, if you're like, oh, this one month, you know, say you have three months that are kind of decreasing, then one month that goes really high after that, you're like, oh, I should sell that. Well, like, maybe. Um, but maybe, maybe there's like, something oh, else behind Maybe that. there's a presidential election, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, so, like, uh, you know, trying to try to figure out that and then, yeah, the, the, like your shapes and things like that. Um, so I guess just yeah. sp- sticking to the volatility and maybe hearing more about, um, the, you know, for, because qu- quantitative modeling around that. Um, so you've got this smile, which is kind of like your, your your mean of the line of your distribution of what you expect to, to happen. And um, the distribution around that for all the different strikes, are those distributions kind of, are they estimated based off historical volatility or forecast volatility or what, what they think realized volatility will be? What are the kind of distributions that are used to model, um, you know, the likelihood of of moves around those um, different strikes. Yeah, so I mean, like you can you can kind of model um, your inventory. You can kind of back test uh, like the risk of certain spreads. You know, say so you have a twenty five delta, ten delta, five delta fly um, kind of thing, and you can plug that in. And then most big firms have back testers, and you could you know check out the variance on that and how much you expect to get out of line and how fast it would mean revert. Right, so like. Um, one, how far I can get out of line, and then two, like I guess how fast it would come back would be two things you'd really want to consider. Um, but like, and in, 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 yeah, and in general, like then you kind of model that within your framework if you can, um, being as generic as possible here. Like you, you need to change your values on those things, and sometimes changing your values on very tight spreads is difficult, right? Like if I have, say, it's two years out and it's two strikes or anything, there's two each other, 
uh, they're going to be insanely correlated, right? I'm like from like a covariance perspective. Um, but like, eventually, you need to put in some kind of risk parameter there because you don't want to carry an infinite amount of that risk. Um, so that's just another thing that's, that's part of the the cycle uh, that didn't wasn't there 20 years ago. I mean, it's probably been there for 15 years now, but it, you know, no one really modeled that stuff 20 years ago. Just because it's um, fast execution these days, and and um, pe- people are responding in real time and changing. So, so I guess what we're talking about here is that the fact that if if there is something that trades on a particular um, you know time time and price at a particular product, then um, you know all other bids and offers potentially on that product could be updated. Is that right? Yeah, and and that's the thing, right? So, like, the, if you don't update, you're gonna just keep getting swung at and like so you need to find a way to change your market on on that option on that spread on that whatever uh and so you have to figure out some kind of automated theoretical way to do that quickly or someone else is going to figure it out faster and and what you're saying is someone's moving in response to what so they're being reactionary with their vol curve and they're updating their vol curve in real time based on some other product that's traded if you don't, you're saying that you may be at the adverse selection of that person updating their vol curve in the fact that they're buying at the right time because they know it's going to move in that direction. And yeah, the market anyone, makers are going to do the same thing. That, and that's one of the harder things to deal with too, is like if people are changing their values, you have to decide if you want to change with them or if you are confident in what you're doing. Um, so you know, your confidence in what you're vending is a big, big deal. Like in some time, and it changes, right? You know, like, if I were making a market in uh, 2010, I don't know. It was re- it was really pretty slow then. Um, one thing, but if you're making a market on March of 2020, you know, the, you, maybe maybe you're way less confident in what you have going on there, and like you're like, okay, well, I don't want to be on an island here. I don't have an opinion. Um, versus when you do, uh, so like that's one of the trickier things. Like it, it'd be really easy to just have your own values all the time. It'd be really easy to just kind of track the market's values, but trying to figure out when when to do which is, is a lot of where uh, the edge comes in. Oh, that's really interesting. I guess, and and also, so speaking about those bad times, maybe so, like um, in twenty twenty, when the markets um, do get really uncertain, can can a market maker ever remove their bids and offers? So, I, as far as I can tell, there's primary bar, um, market makers and secondary market makers on products, and primary market makers need to be in there a certain percentage of time. Is that right? It's different for every product. Um, so. There are markets where you have to vend. Um, there are markets where you don't have to vend. Uh, generally, you want to be in there if you want to trade, but I, I have seen markets where screens just went blank. And that's, um, depending on what position you have on, can be very scary or very exciting. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in God, I'll talk about 07 because I was on my own then. So. Um, yeah, I mean, like when you just start gapping around or the first time they announced QE1, I mean, Markets just just were gone for a little while sometimes, and then they, they you know they come back as everyone kind of figures things out. Are, are market makers allowed to do that? Are they allowed to just just disappear their um you know to take off their their offers and bids? And are there any repercussions with the um actual exchange? Like, like certain ones, there would be you, you could lose your uh, status, uh, but with certain markets, like you're allowed to, and you know they might call you. Um, I've been in markets where. You know, there, there were no markets. And so we got out too, because you didn't want to be the only one out there because what just happened. And yeah. they'll call you and they'll ask you to please put your markets back in. <laughs> you know, like, uh, in general, I don't know of anyone who's really been punished um, for that. I'm sure it's happened. But, I, you know, in general, people just want to be in there enough that it doesn't happen a lot. But I, I've seen it where they, they're just gone or, yeah. or, or just insanely wide, right? Like, I mean, you could have a certain market that's usually a dime wide and everyone's going at $30 wide. Like technically you're in market, but usually they'll have some kind of minimal width too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see, I see that a lot in the uh, gas market in Australia, um, especially on the physical. You'll see um, someone sitting there in the bid and someone sitting there um, on the on the offer, and they're like three dollars apart. You know, yeah. with, with the mid being nine bucks, so you've got this huge, huge uh, uh, discrepancy between where where you're able to sell and buy from if you're going to trade with that guy. But then the actual market, you know, is done in small volumes and they're like 20 cents apart. So, um, yeah, it's it's really interesting to see that, you know, it kind of depends what markets, what time and what else is going on that that limits, you know, what the bid ask spread is. Sure. And then like, so say you were the only one in there, right? You 
you might go unlit, right? So maybe meaning you'll still trade, but you don't want to show because people because like you don't want to. This is another thing that's very different now than then. Uh, when I started, when I started, you know, you're in the pit, so you have your values, and then everyone has their own values, but like they're all basically just yours, right? Now everyone's vending their their values. So like, if I had no idea where to fit things, I could open up a market and fit a smile to it, right? So if you're the only one in there, you don't really want to give. If you're confident, you don't want to give away your values there either, too. So there's a little gamesmanship there too. So yeah, v- v- vending. Do you want to explain that for our audience? Oh, sorry. This I mean, like when we call, we call it vending quotes, whatever you like. So, it's, uh, you know, when I'm sending all spreads and options into the market, we we, we say we're vending quotes then. Um, but that's basically you know you have if you're quoting thirty thousand things, you have thirty thousand bids and thirty thousand asks out there, and if anyone has any kind of uh, even mediocre software, you know, they can look at those values and fit a smile to them and like, okay, well, this is especially at the money, right? At the money vol is here, uh, SKU is here, Kurt is here. But if I feel confident in my values, I don't necessarily want to give them to other people for free if I don't have to. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so what you're saying is some market makers may not, may be delaying updating what they truly think um, to the market until they're sure. ready to respond. Yeah. Right, and then that happens more in crazy times, right? So if you tried to do that in normal market times, you you would just knock it on any trades. Um, yeah. The people who are displaying lit liquidity would get all the trades. So it's it, you know, in the, in the, in a world lit markets where people with multiple people are are, are much better um, for for everybody, but but in crazy times, you know, like it, there's a certain a certain amount of strategy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds appropriate. Oh well, no, that's that's really interesting. Oh, well, I think we've covered off um, market making really well there. Thank you very much, John. Um, yeah. I guess for for um, our last segment, you know, what, what advice would you give um, to young people? So we've spoken that the landscape is very, very competitive to get in and um, people come with a lot of programming experience and, um, you know, maybe through masters and PhDs and they've been working very hard. They're very smart individuals. What differentiates a candidate getting in and what would you recommend to aspiring um, market makers? Great question. Um, a lot of firms are, are, are looking for, you know, good good culture fit, meaning, you know, people who, who want to work in teams, who want to be collaborative. Um, you know, if, if you're just insanely good individually, that can be good. But like in general, you're going to have to work with other smart people. Uh, so, you know, people who can collaborate, people who are looking to work with other people, um, people who are passionate about trading. Uh, for me personally, when I interview people, I tend to find that people who really, really love trading are much more successful than people who don't. Or, you know, I mean, uh, when I got into this industry, it was not, you know, the highest paid industry in the world. Um, now it, it might be. Um, so, you know, you get people who are motivated by different things, but people who actually love trading tend to be a lot more success- successful. Um, and so, yeah, I would just say just getting getting your hands on anything you can get on uh, that's outside the realm of like typical math. I mean, obviously you have to be a good math, you have to be good at coding. But if you came in and you're like, oh, well, I checked out all these other websites and then I researched market making on my own or I've been running my own alpha strategies on some kind of website or I do these trading competitions, that those are the people that like get flagged as like, okay, this person is really interesting. This is the person you want to talk to. Yeah, like and showing what, an actual industry. In, sorry, interest in the industry. No, yeah, that, that's that's really good advice. In terms of the, um, I, I guess most people maybe coming in, they, they might want to learn how to program. Um, what, what dissemination do you see in your own role? Like, um, obviously, you have you have software developers who are you know producing the trading software that you're using to then execute um, these trading strategies on as the pure trader. And then, you know, there is this role in between, which is like the quantitative trader where they maybe they're doing research and they're doing development and they're um, coming up with trading strategies and they're implementing them in, you know, maybe a high level language like Python. Would you be able to explain maybe the roles that you think fit under this umbrella of, of quantitative um, trader, quantitative analyst, um, and then software engineer and kind of where people could aim for if they want to be um, at a firm doing market making? Uh, sure. I mean, this goes, you can even go further than that. Um, so we'll, I guess we'll start as close to the metal as possible. You could have like your your FPGA programmers. Um, that is one of the fastest growing areas. You know, that's basically hardware, programmable hardware. Um, that That's as close to the metal as you can get. And those are very hard to find these days. Um, 
getting easier. And um, you know, on top of that, you have like your low latency people, your C, C plus plus kind of stuff. Um, these are typically you know, people people who work on the systems behind the scenes, the, the way you communicate with the exchange, um, things like that. Like that's where you really really need the speed. You know, it used to be seconds, and now it's probably nanos. Um, wow. Yeah. So like that's a an area, and then when you get into like um, you know your quant developers. Uh, you know, that's going to be mostly coding, but you have to have some kind of understanding of actual options. I mean, maybe not, you're not going to trade them, but you at least understand what a vol smile is, you know, how it works. Like, uh, you know, when you're changing things like your correlations and your covariances and things like that, you're going to have to have a basic understanding there. Um, then yeah, on the, on the research side, um, these are people who are going to like create models, um, create other strategies, um, you know, the real, the, the, the option specific, but very math heavy. Um, and then I don't know how are, the are they usually come in from PhD backgrounds or are they coming out from quant programs or other firms? Uh, <laughs> other firms always, uh, but you know, mostly masters or PhDs. Um, again, but it used to be bachelors. Uh, so like, the, the the math inherently is not that hard. It's the application. I mean, you need it's not it's not easy. But for the the kind of people who are applying, it's, it's not the math is not the hard part. Uh, it's putting it all together. Um, and so those people will be coding in like a a Python and like a C plus plus, right? So like some of your back end stuff, you probably still need to be fast, but you want to be in high level uh, languages for quick programming and understanding and running back tests and things like that. And then your quant traders uh, will generally be putting together actual trading strategies. Um, so probably mostly Python on that end, um, you know, higher, just higher level, uh, but like actual making trades in the market, monitoring how your trades are doing. You're going to be doing a lot of, a lot of monitoring, uh, which sounds boring, but it, it's not like, you know, there's 10,000 things to keep an eye on. Um, but yeah, but you, you, you need, you need very strong coding skills for any of these roles, uh, but obviously the the level of coding is different at each at each station. And I guess to um, to top that conversation off, for the person who um, really wants to become a market maker and be the trader, be the executor, um, and they want to have a career over the next twenty years, um, like you've had in the industry, what what advice would you give to yourself? Um, back then when you're starting out, but with the caveat that it's now in the today's current landscape with today's yeah. technology and today's resources for learning? Uh, I mean, phenomenal question. Like that's, it's, it's, a, it's the biggest combination of world. And maybe it's my bias because that's the area I'm in. Um, but, you know, you need the, like if you're coming in now, like you need, you need coding skills for sure. You need uh, very basic math. Like, I mean, probably maybe advanced probability, but like, it's not as important to understand the linear algebra behind the derivations. Um, but then like, you know, you just need to get like, you need to get in there and you need to get excited about it and you need to get it reps. Um, so, you know, coming in the door, no one's going to expect you to have any kind of actual trading experience. No one's going to expect you to have talked to brokers or experienced markets, but like, just ask like the, so this was one where I'd say the biggest thing would be after you get the job, like just asking people around you. Like I, I had a person, just come bother me every day. Um, you know, who's a quant is asking questions, asking questions, asking questions. And now they're one of the most talented traders around. Just the, the desire to learn is, is what will get you there. Like the passion for it. And if, if it's not there, then it's not there. But if you really, really want it, then you know, just ask people around you and just immerse yourself in it as much as you can, because it's really hard to get experience in trading without trading. <laughs> Yeah, that's phenomenal advice. So being inquisitive and being the person who wants to learn. And yeah. um, and I guess that's they, they, there are few and far between when you see actual true high performers that are willing to go above and beyond and continue asking the right questions. I guess, um, yeah, I, I see it in, in my own industry. Um, people right. get comfortable, it's, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, you know, we'll, you, you bring in a, a bunch of new people there's always just a few who, who really, really want it. Um, and they're generally very successful and, you know, then everyone's got their own things. It's, it's not for everybody. You know, it's a, it's a very demanding job, but yeah, like you can really differentiate yourself by just caring and asking questions and wanting to learn as much as you can. That's excellent. 
Oh, well, thank you very much, John. Um, that's really invaluable advice. And the last piece, we because we spoke about it before, um, you did recommend um, a couple of books, um, had a couple of book recommendations for people who who want to become well-versed in the options and market making um, space. What would those be um, and who would you recommend them to? Oh, man. I mean, basic level, uh, Sheldon Nateberg, um Option volatility and pricing is the Bible for market making. Uh, it's, you know, it's very basic, but it's a lot of, like we said, it's one of those things like there's not a lot of books out there on this stuff. So, you know, he, he'll he teach you the the, the basics there. Uh, Hall uh, is Don't just amazing. Hall. Yeah. yeah. It's really, really good. And then, I mean, honestly, if you're really into it, um, there's books on like the, the history, um, you know, your God, what's the long-term capital book? It's, uh, oh, when genius failed. Um, the new Jim Simon's bio is pretty good. Uh, book quants, like just for like learning how it all came up is kind of interesting. And then I'm trying to think of other specific market making books. Like those are the really good ones for the math. And then you kind of want like the story to go with it. Yeah, that, that's uh, a really interesting perspective, um, John. Yeah, I guess, you know, you, you've been around for 20 years, so you've you've seen these things develop. But um, I guess for people who are starting now and going to start their journey, their 20-year and plus journey, um, the, the, the history is probably often, uh, you know, it's it, it's a nice um, part that actually assists in your learning development and understanding why things are the way they are. And, it, and it's incredibly interesting to see, like, some of the most successful firms today, how close they came to closing down, like, the number of firms that are, are gigantic today that, that have came within a hair of failing is staggering. Uh, so, it, you know, it's, it's always interesting, especially from the quant perspective to realize that, you know, you, know, you live in a world of, of models and normal distributions and, and that's just, sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, so it's good for like, just kind of having the back of your head, like you, I mean, you need to model things, you need to take risks, but like knowing that it's not always, you know, a five SD move, a 10 SD move is going to happen, even though statistically it never, did, you know, like, uh, that things like that are very interesting. No, that's excellent. Hey, and to, to leave um, the viewers um, maybe in adm admiration, but um, also to to kind of get them excited about why they would invest their life into trading. Obviously, it can be a very lucrative career. Would you be sure. willing to say kind of um, what the you know minimum salary that you've kind of seen in the industry for someone who's first starting out all the way into the opportunities for, for people to maybe develop their own um, algorithm and then get percentage and bonus um, off off those when they're implemented. Um, what's kind of the range of salaries and what are the opportunities there? Oh man, it's 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 a gigantic range. Um, so I, yeah, like it's, I've been around some. I know a lot of different people at a lot of different companies. I mean, like you, it's all it's all six figures start. But like, I mean, at a market making firm now, getting three hundred out of school is not unreasonable. Um. Certain firms would pay more than that. Um, and then like actual trading, I mean, it depends on how you do it, right? Uh, but you can make much more than that. If you go the percentage route, you can make much more or much less than that. But like the, and, and who knows, right? Trading is bound to slow down at some point, but the, the money is definitely there right now. <laughs> because uh, the I mean, opportunity and the volatility is there, hey? Yeah, exactly. And the volumes are there. And like, you know, you've seen like the, the retail flows are getting bigger and like it, 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 it maybe it'll come, maybe it'll go away, but like the access to markets is a lot easier. So more people are doing it. You have interest rate volatility now. So people are actually, you know, kind of trying to get in there and hedge a little bit. Um, you know, no one really has an interest in trading interest rates if interest rates are zero, but now, you know, banks, actual hedgers, mortgage companies, things like that are in there. Um, but the, yeah, the, the arms race for talent right now is, is, is insane. So like the, the, the money can be very real from day one. So firms are willing to pay for for talent. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's. I, I mean, I, I can tell you that when I started, I think I made forty grand, and had to do a lot of coffee running. Um, the, the industry is no longer like that. Uh, you you know you, you can make ten times that uh, your first day, and and also like the people are treated differently. You know, they're like people have a no one's. I mean, so you work in physical gas so you, you've heard the yelling and screaming things like that like i used to get just everyone in the pit just yelling screaming yelling screaming now people are kind of like looking to develop people you know there's more of an active actively developing the talent now um it's a more mature industry uh so the opportunities are very different and then you have to get like you know, used to be you had to clerk for or two years or whatever and kind of work your way up now people will just go to another firm uh if you do that so you know people are getting opportunities sooner too 
it's, it's a very good time to be in it's a, it's a very difficult time to get into the industry uh but it's a very good time to get into the industry a difficult time to get in because of the competition and exactly. um, it's a good time to be in it to to be paid and to have a have a lifelong of fun learning how to trade yeah i think i mean i think i saw the 70,000 people or something applied for citadel and citadel securities internships like i mean i i can't imagine well i kind of citadel was probably just a baby when i got started but you know it's probably a thousand people, <laughs> you know. So, like, it, like I said, it's 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 hard. It's incredibly hard, and and you ask really good questions on how to differentiate yourself. And uh, I think that's smart. I mean, you're going to have to have the, the academics to get there too. But like, once you get there, how can you differentiate yourself? And it's probably just love of trading and and any trading experience that you can make for yourself through personal accounts or through trading competitions and things like that. Well, John, that that is invaluable advice and from someone who has had 20 years experience in the market making industry. So thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. Um, any final Absolutely. words? No, I mean, uh, uh, you know, maybe I mean, the industry is constantly changing. So maybe a year from now we can, we can do this again and we can talk about all the things that have changed. But like just the, yeah, you know what I do? Uh, know that this industry changes so fast. Um, this actually has bitten me a couple of times in my career you become really successful and you, you know, you kind of like rest on your laurels. Uh, but like you, it, if you're not constantly innovating, constantly changing, you get left behind so fast. So just always, always, always be pushing, always be curious. If you hear something about a new way of doing things, don't immediately brush it aside, you know, ask more questions because that's happened to me a few times. Like, Oh, these, these people are doing this now. I'm like, Oh, that's silly. We don't need to do that. And then two years later, now you're two years behind and you really wish that like, you had put in the research there because these aren't things you can do overnight. Um, especially from the technology perspective, just know that like, if you get in this industry, it's going to be totally different five years from, from now. And then it's going to be completely different five years from then. Like it's, it's going to keep getting crazier and crazier. And so you're going to have to keep, uh, keep at it and keep updating your, your skill set. So the learning isn't done after university. No, I think that's the learning is advice. never done. <laughs> Oh, well, th thank you very much again for coming on, John. And um, and we yeah, hopefully get to speak to you in a year's time and maybe do a face-to-face. -face. Yeah, thanks for having me.